In today's video, we're going to take a look at what it's like to use this Altair 680 in its minimum configuration. And in that configuration, we have a total of 1K of RAM, and you can see that on eight chips underneath those two transformers. We had a 256 byte monitor on a 1702 EEPROM that you see there. Over here on the left, we have a 6850 UART that allows for a serial connection to a console serial port. And then of course, everything is run by our 6800 processor down here. Now the console you most likely would have used back in the days would have been a teletype like the one you see here. This provides your operator console, keyboard, and printer. And then it also has a teletype for giving you some mass storage input and output. All right, let's go ahead and get this turned on. Sorry for all the bumping. All right, turn on the teletype. Power switch for the uh, 680 is in the back. And to start a 680, you always go halt, reset, and run. And over here, you heard the teletype kick into action. Let's see if we get a good view. I'm gonna try to run it with a plastic cover down to reduce noise. Hopefully we can still read it. The dot you see there is, is the prompt. All right, there's only a few commands, one of which is a memory modify examine command, as you'd expect. It's an M. So you type the letter M followed by a four-digit hex address to examine any location. So examine location zero, for example. You can see the content is presently zero. At this point, it's waiting for you to input something. If you input two valid hex digits, those will get written to memory. If you input anything else, it'll just go back to the prompt. For example, carriage return is not a valid hex digit, so you can just type in a carriage return here, and we're back to the prompt. Uh, shortcut to examining sequential locations is the M command, or next. You can see that just takes us to location one. If I do it again, you're up to location two. Now I can change location two. Let's put in a 45. As soon as I type that second digit, it automatically updates it. So now let's take a look at that location two and see if it changed. And you can see our 45 is in there. On the end command, you don't have to hit return at the end. It can be any character that's not a hex digit and it will go on. So I tend to just leave my finger on the end key and keep hitting it like this. All right, um, so we can examine change memory. Another command in here is the jump command. Jump allows you to jump to any address you want to execute code. Now I haven't entered anything yet, um, so I don't want to jump anywhere because it will go off into never never land. But here I can show you an easy way to abort a command. Whenever it's expecting a hex value, <coughs> excuse me, you can type any invalid hex digit and it just boards back to the prompt. All right, another command in here is the load command, L. This allows you to load, most typically from paper tape, where it expects to see Motorola S records. That would be the typical output from a, um, a Motorola assembly. This is pretty much the exact same thing as Intel hex records, just with a slightly different syntax. Now to end uh, an S record file, it's an S9 record. So I can always just manually type an S9 since um, it comes in from the same serial port and it thinks it's all done. So that's a way to get out of an L command if you ever needed to. All right, and the last command is a P command, which you probably think is a punch command. And that makes perfectly good sense because what good is a load command if you can't punch something to begin with to read? Um, but it's not a punch command. There is no punch command, and that's to me a very serious omission, and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. The P command is actually a proceed command, uh, which is used with a very simple breakpoint mechanism they have in this. If you put a software interrupt instruction, SWI, in your code, then the uh, monitor will grab a hold of that, and then allow you to see the registers um, in memory and of course modify and change them or memory if you needed to. And then the P command allows you to start your program back up with the change values in the registers you made, if any. So that works and it's nice to have it, but uh, you certainly need a, a punch command. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. All right, so then at this point, what would we do with the computer? We've got the monitor up and running. Um, what can you do with it? Well, with 1K of RAM, you can't run basic. Uh, you're not going to really be able to run an assembler editor. What would you do if you wanted to just put a program in, maybe just a simple hello world program? Well, you're going to have to assemble that by hand, write it on a piece of paper, assemble it into machine code by hand, 
and then punch it in using the memory in the next commands to run it. And that's what we're going to go ahead and try um, here next. We'll go ahead and do a hello world program all manually. So I've written a hello world program for the 680. It actually says Altair 680 instead of hello world. I wrote it in 6800 assembly and then uh, hand compiled that or hand assembled that into machine language, which is the hex bytes we can punch in using the monitor. So let's go ahead and go through that exercise to see what it would have been like to have to hand put in a program, even a very, very small one. All right, hopefully we can read this. There's our prompt. I have this at 200. And so the first value is the CE. As soon as I type in that E, it closes it and goes to the next location by using the N command, and that's a two. All right, now I can just repeat the next commands over and over and uh, type in this program. So I'll try to shut up for a while. Where am I? Let's see. Location seven. Let's say we got a double entry. Let me just make sure that's okay. Yeah, F6 is correct there. Let's see, where am I? I'm at 20C, so I have to do 20D. Okay. more garbage there. Let me look at that again. Another garbage character. Don't know whether I have heavy fingers or I'm having teletype problems. Okay. 213 is supposed to be a 41 looks like. Get a lot of double fours, it looks like. I have to work on this teletype. Believe it or not, that's it. Hopefully I typed it in correctly. You can see it's very easy to make mistakes. Now, new teletypes in the old days might not have been as finicky as this one, but yeah, even back then they were often quite finicky. So let's see if we got this right. We'll jump to 200, and if it works, hopefully it'll say Altair 6A. Hey, it worked. All right, so I had the program jump back to the monitor. Um, that's why we get our dot prompt back. All right, so we've got this program typed in. Uh, not too bad, but it doesn't do much of anything. In a bigger program, you can imagine how difficult it would be. Um, so of course, what we'd like to do now is save this so that we can demonstrate it to the next person that walks in and is um, just as interested in this as we are, of course, right? Um, but like I mentioned, there is no punch command. So there's no way to write this out. Um, to me, this is just a terrible shortcoming. Now, I understand it was a small prom. They didn't have room for it. Um, probably take another 70 to 80 hex bytes to get a punch command writing out S records. Um, but I would have gladly paid for a second EEPROM in this to have a punch command. Um, Southwest Technical Computer had both a load and a punch. That's one thing that made it so easy to get up and running with it. All you could do here is write your own punch command um, in assembly, on paper, and then type in all the hex bytes of that. I mean, you put it up in high RAMs, the high RAM of the 1K, so up at, say, 380 hex. 
and then that way you would put your programs you want to punch down lower and they wouldn't overlap each other. Um, that's, that's not going to be trivial because it's hard to do this by hand. So maybe you use a computer at school if you were in college and used a cross assembler and punched a tape. Or maybe you know somebody that had a Southwest Technical and you use their computer to punch the tape. Or maybe, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm out of ideas. It'd be nice to have it in EEPROM one day as well, of course, right? Um, and before I'm all done with this, I'll probably put this punch command in EEPROM. But anyway, so what I have done is I've gone ahead and used my Southwest Technical and an assembler editor running on that to create the punch program and put it on a paper tape that runs at 380. So let me go ahead and load that. Alright, so I'll type the L for load and then start the tape. done. So, I mean, that's not a terribly long load, um, but you can see that was a lot more typing than we did for the Hello World program, and so it would be non-trivial to make this program. All right, to use this program to punch, we have to put uh, <clears throat> the range to punch down in memory. So at 60, you put the start address you want to punch, and we want that to be 200. And at 62, uh, we want the end address. And that needs to be like 21E, 21F or so. All right, so now we have given the start and end addresses of what we want to punch. Now we just need to jump to the punch routine at 380. So jump, 0, 3, 8. And as soon as I hit that last zero, it'll start punching. Now this punch program um, punches out some leader. Actually, it turns on the punch for us automatically. It punches out some leader and then the data. So I'm gonna press the zero now. All right, and it punches out a little bit of um, trailer at the end so that it, we end nice and cleanly. All right, so there's our whole Hello World program. Oops, I'm not even showing you. Um, there's the Hello World program, nice and short. All right, let's go ahead and kill power to this machine. All right, halt, reset, run. Go over here and do a load the load command and then I'll load this up on the paper tape. Nice and quick. And so now we have our Hello World program loaded. We just jumped to 200. All right, so we've proven we can enter a program, um, punch it out. Obviously, we uh, we use some external resources to do that. And what I'm going to do in my system is actually put that code into an EEPROM, so it's always there, like it was in the Southwest Technical. Um, so we can hand do a program. So now the next question is, uh, is there any more you could do in this base configuration? There's actually a program that was on the 8080 as well called VTL, very tiny language. And it's actually not bad. 
and can run on this base machine on a few EEPROMs and just 1K of RAM. I'm just going to demonstrate that real briefly. So as we've seen, using and programming this base configuration of the 680 can be a bit difficult and cumbersome. And if you did not have access to another computer on which you could run a 6800 assembler and punch paper tapes, then frankly you probably didn't write too too many programs for this other than a few demonstrations of roughly the complexity of what we just did with the Hello World. And it wouldn't be too long before you were kind of running out of things to do and a bit disappointed in what you could do with this new computer you had. Now one thing you could do is add more memory and run Altair Basic. That was available for this machine. But in today's dollars, by the time you added the memory and basic, you would have spent $3,500 today. And that's quite a bit more than you spent for the computer to begin with. So there's a good chance that wasn't even an option for you. Not to mention the fact that running Altair Basic on this computer is not the best of uh, the programming worlds. And we'll look at that in another video that's coming up. There was one other option, however, that you could use this base configuration and still have a decent programming environment, and that was the VTL, very tiny language that we mentioned. Um, I was going to do a quick demo here, but frankly, that language is impressive enough that I really want to do more of a demo than that, so I want to go into a little bit more detail. So I'm going to end this video here and extend this series about the base configuration to a second video where we're going to also cover the VTL, the very tiny language.